So this is going to be a, just a short presentation uh, on the Archaea. What I want to do really is just do a, a very brief introduction to the, um, the groups of the Archaea and some of the unique features that they have um, that have to do more with their metabolism than the, the structures that we've talked about before. So it's a very fast review, and if you don't remember this or didn't go through it before, I have another uh, short lecture on differences between the archaea and the bacteria between those two domains. Um, so you go back and review that. Um, there's a number of, of biochemical differences, uh, and then there's certain similarities. So the archaea are, are also prokaryotes, like bacteria. Uh, the archaea, though, have certain differences, right? Their chromosomes um, have introns within them, but bacteria do not uh, have introns. Their cell membranes are have a different chemistry. So the phospholipids uh, typically are branched, or they can be branched. Uh, so when we have a phospholipid, typically they have the fatty acid tails like this, but they can have branching uh, tails like this. Uh, in addition to that, their phospholipids can form monolayers. So they can have phospholipids that actually join together um, from one side of the bilayer to the other forming a monolayer, which, which will make them different. Um, and, and there's a whole variety of other, they do have a, um, a whole variety of different types of cell walls. So if you go, there's another uh, short lecture I have on cell walls of the archaea. Some have just an S layer, some have a peptidoglycan-like structure that's just that's slightly different. So there's a whole variety uh, of different sorts of things there. In general, they are uh, small prokaryotic cells, um, somewhat like the bacteria, but they're, they're far less studied, partly because um, they're often found in extreme environments. So they are not all extremophiles, but many are what we call extremophiles. Meaning that they live in environments that have extreme temperatures, for example, extreme pHs, a variety of different chemical compositions that would normally be thought to be toxic to life, yet we find uh, these archaea there. Now, working with them in labs uh, is very difficult because you would have to then create those environmental conditions to grow them. And often we can't work in uh, environments that are that hot. They damage certain pieces of lab equipment, the normal things we use, we either acquire special things. Um, so we don't have a lot that are been cultured right in different ways. Now, how are the um, archaea classified, right? primarily classified the same way, and they're separated from the bacteria by the 16S ribosomal RNA classification. So remember, this is a domain. Now, these are the names of several groups within the archaea. This is something that's constantly being revised. Um, they are sometimes, some, several of these are called phyla, um, but some of them have been placed at a, a kingdom within the domain. Some of them have been placed at different levels um, throughout time and will probably continue to be placed at different levels. But these are very common groups. Many of them are, are used and have been used for quite a while in classification. So they're names that have characteristics of organisms associated with them that would be good to be familiar with. And so there's just these five, there could be, could be a lot more, but this is all we're gonna kind of go over today as some of the major groups, all right? So don't worry specifically about level, like are these phyla or just, they're groups of archaea, okay? With certain characteristics. And I just wanted to talk about uh, very briefly here, so you have as an overview. So the first one is the Thalma archaeota. The Thalma archaeota uh, is probably one of the most abundant uh, groups. So maybe, may be the most abundant um, because we can't really um, find all the the archaea and culture and work with them and all the people they're always discovering archaea these uh, archaea are, are in the soils and they play a very valuable uh, role in nutrient recycling so they're one of the very few uh, known living things that are ammonia oxidizers
So in addition to being able to, um, first off, they can oxidize ammonia. So they could use ammonia for electrons that, that can give them energy. All right. So they are, um, there, the word for that, if you remember back when we went through the um, different levels of bacteria, uh, nutrient utilization. So for where do they get their uh, energy from, from a organic uh, or inorganic source and so on. So these ones are called chemo litho autotrophic. So chemo litho autotrophic members of this group. Um, so there are some very um, a lot, very um, well known um, members of the group um, and as soil bacteria. So uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I can't read this writing here. I just don't want to spell it wrong because they're. Uh, so for example, nitro H A. Yeah, E R A L E S. Nitrous ferales uh, is a soil bacteria. Uh, and so these organisms are important because they're part of uh, nitrogen, nitrogen cycling uh, in the soils and they're unique in how they get their, their energy. All right, so this is a very abundant group of chemolithoautotrophic um, archaeota. How are they unique? Is that they're, instead of using um, the organic molecules um, for energy or for electrons to oxidize them, they're using ammonia, or an inorganic molecule. And then, then there makes them very important in soil and nutrient cycling. So kind of, that's kind of the main thing to take away to, to keep in mind. So the, the Krenarchaeota, uh, as the next group, um, they contain okay, several major groups um, within them, so subgroups. Um, so you have uh, groups of uh, acidophiles. And I am going to have to try and uh, separate these. You also have, uh, within the Krenarchaeota, thermophiles. And so organisms that are both acidophiles and thermophiles would be found in hot springs, for example, in Yosemite National Park. So the water in there uh, is incredibly hot and it's very acidic. Um, Typically, you wouldn't think anything could live uh, in water that is, is, is that hot or that acidic, and yet we find these particular organisms living in there, and people sample them, and they, sam they sample the water, and then they'll find the DNA, and then they look for certain genes, and they'll find that the presence of different specific Krenarchaeota there, and, and compare them between different sites to see if they are uh, unique to a certain site or, or if they're widespread. Um, you also have um, sulfur reducers here. So some of the sulfur reducers belong to this group. So remember, reduction uh, is where they're gaining electrons. Oxidizer is losing electrons. So um, these guys are actually able to use sulfur as a final electron acceptor instead of oxygen. Okay, so that's another way that they're they're different in their metabolism. So you have uh, extreme environments that they can live in, and then unique metabolism. So Krenarchaeota have members that have those characteristics or traits. Uriarchaeota, go to those guys. Um, this is a um, fairly diverse group. There's a lot of thermophiles in this group as well. Uh, but this group is one that's going to contain primarily the um, methane producers. So these organisms actually produce uh, methane uh, gas. Uh, and so that subgroup of the archaea typically all belong here into the, the Uriarchaeota, the, um, the methane producers. Also, we see within this group some of the extreme, uh, extreme halophiles. All right, those are the organisms that 
do not just tolerate high salt concentrations, but actually require very high salt concentrations in order to survive. For a lot of organisms, uh, a high salt content could kill them, um, and some can tolerate it, but these are ones that actually uh, require it. A halophile actually requires that. So these other two groups um, have a, a variety of different, um, this one in particular, the Coracheota, different levels. Some, some things uh, I've read had a single species in the group, and then later it was a, it was a much larger uh, category with a large number of species within it. So like I said, the, the categories or rankings of where they are um, changes quite quite often. Um, but the, the Coracheota are uh, the terrestrial thermophiles. Uh, also found in uh, hot springs. And I should mention that this group, the uh, the Crenarchaeota hot springs, but also really here, slightly different. This, these are more the hot springs, actually more with Yellowstone, the national park. These really, at the bottom of the ocean, uh, are hydrothermal vents. Which are kind of like kind of like the same thing, but but different. Um, these are places where the cracks in the ocean floor pulls in salt water. The salt water gets superheated, and then at certain locations it bursts out from the the floor, kind of kind of like the the, the springs um, and geysers that we find in uh, Yellowstone. But this is at the bottom of the ocean, uh, and associated with these hydrothermal vents uh, are a whole variety of different organisms, you very unique organisms, um, that are all based off of some of the metabolism of the bacteria really that can live there and tolerate those conditions that provide then the, the nutrient base for all these other like animals that, that actually live there as well. Different types of worms and crabs and, and uh, mollusks and all as well. So, um, here with this group, that's kind of the difference between these are the hydrothermal vents, hydrothermal vent bacteria um, typically all belong to this group, the, the Crenarchaeota. But the Coracheota are primarily just the terrestrial ones. They're not uh, typically the ones found at the hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. Different, different. And then the Nanarchaeota, this group um, is a small group. Uh, and this group, uh, in some some places I've read again, it had just a single species of it in it, um, but this particular genus, in I, sorry, Ignococcus uh, is uh, an organism that is an uh, obligate. Uh, cellular, and we could say parasite, but in this case, it's, it's typically the organism that it lives with. It's a symbiote. So if you think back to uh, material that we covered recently, we said um, organisms have certain genes that are typically expressed all the time, uh, which we call generically housekeeping genes. Okay. Uh, and so those particular genes required for just basic life functions. Uh, these organisms lack some of those housekeeping genes, what we call also called the constitutive genes. Uh, so without them, they couldn't they couldn't survive and live. So they live inside another cell, uh, and typically uh, these cells, there's a particular group of cells that they live inside. And um, I guess I didn't write down the specific uh, name. So there's certain bacteria that they live with inside as well. Uh, and that they're cellular symbiotes within those organisms, right? And this is a group called the Nanarchaeota. So they're very small. They have one of the smallest genomes. And that's partly because like I said they're, they're lacking a large number of, of genes. So, um, and they're typically strict anaerobes you know, as well. Um, Th those are some of the major groups. Okay, the Thaumarchaeota, uh, which are these ammonia oxidizers. So keep in mind that that's one of the um, key, unique, important things about that group. The Crenarchaeota, 
which are a group that we find at the hydrothermal vents, um, which is where um, they're incredibly hot, right? And there's sulfur there. They also have subgroups of them, which are acidophiles as well. We find, find found in hot springs. The Eurarchaeota um, are thermophiles, all right? And they are methane producers. So the ones that will produce methane gas. The Coarchaeota are typically the terrestrial thermophiles found in those hot springs. And the Nanarchaeota, one of the smallest groups with the smallest genomes that their cells can't live on their own. They actually have to live inside other cells. So um, there are two other aspects of this. Like I said, I mentioned there are other um, lectures I gave on archaea, on cell walls of archaea, and then differences between the uh, bacteria and the archaea. So those would be two things to review as well, and then do a quick <coughs> review of these terms uh, as far as the names of these groups. Uh, and that will be all we're going to cover. All you'll have, really have to know for our class on the archaea.